Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Simonson. I'm the Director of Public Outreach at the Leo Beck Institute. And um, I'm excited today to... Um, before before we continue, maybe we should all make sure we're muted because I hear pe other people talking. Um, so we're going to discuss today the book, The Morning Gift by Ava Ibbotson. Um, Ava Ibbotson, who we're going to learn more about, but I'll speak briefly about her. Um, she's not so well known in America. She was a Viennese born British novelist. She's most known for her children's books. Um, she also wrote, however, some historical novels. Uh, this actually book um, is written kind of in the style of a romance. She wrote a few books like this as well, but based on historical events. Um, I think in a way, probably all her books can be that are of a historical nature, can be traced back in many ways to her own experiences as a refugee in England. Um, our guest today is Dr. Amy Williams, and we're excited to have her today. I'm going to introduce you to her. Dr. Amy Williams is currently a fellow at the Zolberg Institute on Migration and Mobility at the New School um, in New York. For the past two years, she was the module leader of the undergraduate module Holocaust and Genocide at Nottingham Trent University. Her, new re um, her newly written co-authored book with Professor Bill Niven, Memory of the Kinder Transport in National and Transnational Memories, Exhibitions, Memorials, and Commemorations has recently been published by Camden House. She is working on her next co-authored book with Bill um, for Yale University Press on the Transnational History of the Kinder Transport, which will be published in 2026. She has a third book for Middle Deutscher Verlag, which is entitled Kinder Transport, Eine Spurensuche, or In Search of the Kinder Transport. And that's a book of testimony based on 150 interviews she conducted with uh, Kinder Transport children. So I am going to turn this over to you, Amy. Thank you for joining. Oh, and it's Amy's birthday today, which that was a very nice little surprise. So it was also super nice she joined us on her birthday. So Amy has a presentation, and she will uh, begin the presentation, and then we will open it up to a conversation. Okay, Amy, you're welcome to go. Oh, thank you ever so much for having me. Um, yeah, so my uh, work is on the kinder transport, and I know this sort of novel is, is very much related to um, that with, with journeying with refugee stories. And my PhD did look at... Um, the fictionalization of the kinder transport and I read quite a few novels on a on these types of stories so um it was really um a privilege to read Eva's book um I'm ready for the powerpoint if that's okay thank you um and the second slide please Great. So I love how the book starts. It's it's so interesting. For me, it just reminded me of psychogeography and this sort of like mental mapping of a city. Um, I know Michael and I have talked a little bit about this. It doesn't seem that Vienna truly comes alive um, through um, Eva's writing at this point. It, there, there seems a detachment, but there's also this sense of nostalgia as well, but this sort of nostalgia over something that's in the past, something that um, she doesn't know necessarily too much about. Vienna seems to be this sort of character that we never really know in the book. Um, there is this sense of, um, in French, derive or to, to drift around the city. Um, you know, she talks about uh, uh, the history, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is really interesting. She talks about these sort of intertwining histories of, of empire with the British side of things and the Aust Austro-Hungarian side of things, which you could sort of think of, and this is speculation, but sort of her sort of intertwined history that we later come to see um, in the book, but also Eva's personal history as well. Um, to me, how I read her book, Life in Vienna Before the War is very idealised. Um, at points, it seems even imaginary in places. Um, as Michael and I have discussed, it, it really um, speaks to all the stereotypes, you know, with the culture, with the museums, with the music. Um, it's a real fairy tale, but as we know, fairy tales have unhappy parts to them. 
Um, and this is what we can start to see, you know, as, as Quinn goes to Vienna and then leaves and comes back, there's this total sense of this fairy tale, is this dreamlike um, place with this, the music and the culture and the, the cafe lifestyle is totally um, dismantling. Um, it, it, it's becoming a nightmare with the restrictions with the Anschluss um, and things that obviously you, you are all, all familiar with. Um, what I found particularly interesting about the start of the book is this notion of um, being a pilgrim in your own city. You know, what did refugees do before they left? Um, in many cases, it was a, a rush job um, and people didn't, you know, ha were able to say their farewells and goodbyes. But for Ruth and for Quinn, this sort of journeying around the city and, and sort of reliving parts of her childhood or standing in places and sort of taking that sort of atmosphere in before she she departs, I thought was really interesting. It got me thinking about um, whether other refugees did this, did they write about it, this sort of journeying um, and visiting places um, before they before they left or, um, you know, was it more more of a, um, a rushed sort of process? Um, she really has time to take things in a little bit more. Um, and I suppose that sort of taking it in more, you could say that, she that part is there because she tries to escape once and, and and it fails you know she's turned back at the border um so the second time is you know she has this sort of moment to to really take things in a little bit more maybe um that's speculation but that's you know uh that's how I read it um and what I really like and I know Michael may talk about this in a little bit more um when we have the discussion is this like forwards and backwards motion um between Austria and and um England um but also this forwards and backwards in time and space this sort of um one minute we're talking about empire and this sort of nostalgia and the next minute we're talking about present day issues um and sort of this doomed city um as it's referred to um and that if you can tell, um, that is a picture of the National History Museum from the period. So, um, you know, these sort of grand opulent buildings that she sort of describes um, are, in are interested in the way that she does it because the British side of things, when we come to that, it seems more authentic. It seems more like a lived experience. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, thinking about Eva herself, you know, she didn't live in, in Vienna for a, a long time. You know, most of her life was lived in other countries and particularly in Britain. Um, and this sort of not um, not fully coming to terms with the city or not sort of really living in the city, um, could that be a reflection of how she talks about it in terms of Ruth? Ruth seems sort of detached slightly from Vienna. Um, while, like I said, while there is certainly a, a deep connection there, um, roots seem to be splitting already there's sort there's a, splin a splintering that is already taking place within the first um couple of pages i thought anyway um next slide please um emigration obviously we've just had holocaust memorial day three days ago um i found this a really interesting topic throughout the book um and this is a quote from the the book the british don't mind which I found so interesting because my research shows that, you know, Britain put a lot of barriers and so many hurdles for refugees to, to climb over. Um, it seems in this, this particular book, um, the British are um, favourably, I would say, looked upon. Um, it's quite interesting. There are times where um, they're having these conversations around leaving and it, it and it seems that Britain is presented as you know somebody that has the doors open and and actually it's the Austrians that are are putting the barriers there um the Brits are sort of there with welcome welcoming arms um as it says it's not the British refusing to let her in it's the Austrians refusing to let her out um and there is some truth to that um but I think it, it doesn't necessarily speak to all the sort of logistical paperwork that the Brits really did um, put in place. Um, uh, yeah, and then just to go just to go back, I thought the conversations around immigration and who was leaving and when were really interesting. Um, there were a lot of conversations um, 
you know, who is left, who is thinking of leaving, um, how are they getting out, you know, what are the people's options they talk about as this photo, this, you know, quite famous photo shows that um, there were lines of, you know, uh, people were queuing up to emigrate. Um, and what I thought about, which was really interesting, which I discussed with Michael, obviously, Ruth is, is um, Catholic and Jewish, she has one parent who's Jewish, one person, uh, one parent, sorry, who's Catholic. Um, and these sort of, I mean, somebody refers to themselves as a five eighth Jewish or something like that in the book. Sort of these ident uh, Jewish identity in the book is is really represented in a quite interesting way. This sort of, um, you know, how Jewish are you sort of thing. Um, and she constantly refers to herself as being only partly Jewish. Um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, further on in the talk um there's uh, again all the sort of typical things are there the, the the fear of incarceration after the Anschluss and Kristallnacht um the sort of um backwards and forwards with with paperwork the stories of Ruth being sent back at the border um these are all things that you I would you know typically um you would see in in sort of these sort of novels um but what I found was really interesting the sort of she said she links it back to sort of um older times where she would have Jewish uh, a Jewess maybe would have claimed sanctuary in a church or in a temple she's now claiming sanctuary at one point in a museum and then in a total foreign land um you know her country's totally abandoned her um and I thought that was an interesting sort of um difference and something that we wouldn't always see typically um within these sort of refugee novels this sort of link back to like what um a Jewish would have like done in a similar situation many many years ago um and the use of student transport I obviously studying the kinder transport was really interesting throughout because obviously she's a much older character she's you know early she's 2019 sort of thing and the the re reference to student transport is really interesting throughout and I know we'll come back to talk about that shortly as well um next slide please um, yeah, I love that the Orient Express gets a mention. Um, so yeah, living with the British. Um, like I said, overall, uh, it's it to me, it's very much a celebratory, rosy narrative around Britain. Uh, it really does um speak to how we remember. Um, it's it, for me, it's such a British novel, and I will we'll talk. I'm sure we'll talk a, a lot more in the discussion about that. Um, there are critical moments, and I'll come back to those at, at some points, but. The, the critical moments at the start is that, you know, people have to retrain or we take exams. These are like, you know, people that have had illustrious careers that are suddenly finding themselves doing, um, you know, becoming maids or chauffeurs or things like that. Um, it's interesting. There are these hints um, in the book around certain classes and um, particularly the British upper class being a, a, an odd bunch. <laughs> you know, how they respond to the refugee crisis is interesting. It's sort of what we would say is like casual anti-Semitism. Um, they really, there is a dislike of foreigners. And at one point they're saying, oh, no more refugees. But gradually, 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 there's a a, a little bit more of an understanding and a, an awareness of um, what people are actually going through. But there are these like really quite awful moments throughout the book um, where there are these sort of one-liners um, and they are really critical and horrible um, and for me very anti-Semitic and I'll, we'll come back to those in, a, in another slide shortly. Um, it's filled with this sort of British stiff, stiff upper lip um, style you can see throughout and I'm wondering if that sort of is how Eva was brought up. Um, you can really see this, it, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily deal with emotions sometimes. On some levels it does but on, on other things um, we sort of skip over the emotional side. Um, I find it really interesting with Quinn, you know, he's very, um, you know, this sort of knight on a white shiny horse sort of thing. He's like willing to risk his reputation, you know, to, to marry her and, and to like whisk her off. Um, but as soon as they're married, which is done very quickly and very interestingly that the British consulate would, yeah, just come in, get married, done, no questions asked. Um, that he, he, as soon as they're married, he remembers to put, um, funds into the Spanish orphans box, you know, um, as if all Brits were doing, you know, this charity work, you know, as if all British people are humanitarians. Uh, I found that quite problematic, but interesting as well. Um, next slide, please. 
yeah family bonds and escape the, i think this is another theme that runs throughout um and a a, a a line that i found particularly moving considering it was holocaust memorial day and the work that i do arriving means living and living is hard um that line really stuck with me and i was talking with michael um beforehand and we were saying that it, it's not necessarily a hard hitting novel um but it's very subtly done you know um the word horror or horrors is used several times you know it's not graphic in its description of um uh the sort of um horrors that people are witnessing prior to leaving um it's very subtly dropped in and i think for me that makes it quite powerful because most of the time she's talking about love or like infatuation or things like that and then suddenly the, the, there are these sort of sentences that for me have more of an impact then because you're like oh gosh this is like out of the blue and um it, it's just hard hitting for me i just think you know there there is a reflection on how difficult it actually was to adjust to a new life um again this sort of the britishness with the 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 paperwork is done very speedily and i think sort of escape narratives particularly around the kinder transport we often see this as a very uh like a jolly holiday sort of thing as if it's this big like exciting adventure and it, it wasn't um and i think that again the fact that the paperwork was done so speedily in the british consulate you know come back in at the, at the end of the day and your passports will be ready is not necessarily um what would have happened in reality um and again this sort of real contrast between how ruth feels so terrified that she'll be sent back to the border and the contrast between Quinn it's like well we're British you know it's just a formality we move through borders like there's like they're nothing whereas borders and then the movement across borders is so terrifying for for refugees and particularly at this point um and Quinn sort of bats it off as if it's it's nothing sort of thing so that sort of lack of understanding I found really interesting and again the sort of white cliffs of Dover this image of like freedom and all this sort of stuff is contrasted with how Ruth feels. Um, you know, she's like, oh, it's not as impressive as, as I thought. And I think, you know, some people thought Britain was this, the be all and end all sort of thing, that it was a, a place that would be welcoming. And actually, as we see from the book, it's not always a welcoming place. Safety doesn't necessarily mean that you're treated fairly or that people even want you there. Um, and then I think, I found it quite humorous in some places um, where these people that have lived very, uh, again, really interesting uh, lives in Vienna are, are now suddenly working in tea rooms and, and as maids and things like that. And are being fired because they don't know how to do their jobs properly. Um, and again, this is this this is reality as well, you know, they're, they're, but I thought there was quite a humor there as well. Um and then again, this sort of what I would expect to find in these sorts of novels, that there is this new helplessness as news constantly arrives from the continent. Um, you know, just because you've escaped, it doesn't mean that mentally you're not still living at home or feeling uh, that sense of isolation or loneliness. You know, the, the, that sort of dislocation is still there, even though you're in a new country and, and you're safe, physically safe. Um and I, we were talking about this with Michael as well before um, the relationships Ruth has with her parents. Her mom seems distant slightly where her dad is really um, the one that is, I want to go back to find my child. I want to, you know, uh, one of these new, uh, one of these new student transports taking place. There's, uh, there's a sense of like wanting to be reunited and that sort of, you know, can't live without us sort of thing. Um so that's why the, the yeah the family bond situation is something I'm sure we can come back into the uh, to, into the discussion. I know Michael has some um, some thoughts there. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so the world of refugees. I thought this was quite interesting. Um, sort of Finchley Road. Um, I mean Finchley Road was was sort of renamed Finchley Strasse. You know, it was a it is a road in London that so many um, shops, restaurants. Um, all those sorts of things like refugees um, made this sort of road their own and Swiss Cottage as well that had a very famous um, 
cafe that a lot of refugees went to. Um, and there's this sort of new bubble is created. If we think of Vienna as a, a sort of, I think Vienna is quite a bubble in um how she speaks about it and not that it's necessarily recreated but it is to a degree you know they're living next to this doctor and this physician and this 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 you know they're they're living next to refugees that have come from a particular kind of world and background um and finchley road swiss cottage um bellsides park where they live um was a real interesting place at that point and it was really round the corner from um, the British Museum, but also um, Bloomsbury House. Bloomsbury House was um, like the centre for, um, you know, getting refugees out. It is. It was where the Central British, off, uh, sorry, yeah, the Central British Fund were, um, who were responsible for the kinder transports for the academics that came over and the domestics. Um, so this whole area in London is is a real sort of. Uh, uh, space where these sort of stories were you know lived out sort of thing in, in reality um and obviously she Eva lived there herself so um when she describes these areas for me they come alive a lot more than than you know her time in Vienna um next slide please um yeah we talked I talked about this at the start um uh, for me it is littered with British anti-Semitism in in quite interesting ways um, there's this one bit where this quite well-off lady says, um, if there was one thing she did not wish to examine so early in the morning is a Jewish waitress on the beach, you know, um, there's another bit where she says that, um, this girl, this Jewish refugee, um, this girl thinks she's entitled, um, you know, to anything and everything sort of thing. Um, there are these sort of casual, um, lines where, sort of Ruth's identity is questioned you know but then that's totally contrasted when with all the students at um, Cambridge who you know rally around her and say she's being victimized because of her Jewishness um, and I think Ruth and her Jewishness is really interesting throughout the novel um, you know these sort of uh, narratives around how Jewish are you with the, the quartering and everything like that and she says she's she's part Jewish um it sort of as the book continues she sort of leans more towards or into her Jewishness um and I know we, me and Michael have uh, different reasons as to why she does this um next slide please and I should also mention that um, with, with regards to British anti-Semitism, she doesn't really mention the sort of um, fascist movements that were uh, taking place in Britain at the time. That's sort of left out. Um, it's sort of these sort of more, which we would say like casual sort of forms of, of anti-Semitism, these sort of ladies making these snarky comments sort of thing. Um, she sort of leaves it on that level she doesn't really go into like a more societal level I mean she sort of it, you know refers to that through these ladies but they're of a particular standing um it's very much an old guard sort of thing um as we see with the students and, and other people um you know there is more of a warmness and openness there towards refugees um but I think sort of, yeah, she doesn't really go into like what was happening in London at the time. And there were protests. There were protests against bringing people in. There were awful things written in newspapers. And she 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 shies away from from talking about that. And I'm wondering, is that because of her love for Britain? You know, she writes about Britain in a very, um, again, like, like I said, celebratory way. Um, and yeah, coming back to the idea, sort of wrapping up now, it is, a, as as Michael said, it's a romance novel. Um, it's it's very, very rather interestingly written because, you know, you, she could have wrote it like a very serious account of um, escape. And that is there, not to, not to take that away, but this sort of the love stories throughout make it for an interesting read. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think the final sort of slide, uh, slide, sorry, the final chapter is really interesting. We sort of skip to the end of the war um, and everything is rosy and happy, um, which is, again, like a, a very British love story. Um, and I'm wondering why that is. You know, is it because Ruth, but also Eva herself, felt very British? She falls for the, the British character, not the um, Jewish refugee. 
is that because she wants to she feels more british and she identifies with being more british than um you know living in a sort of refugee world um i'd love to hear your thoughts on that um uh uh and then um yeah the sort of romance side of things i found was really interesting in the sense of um it's not necessarily a typical romance novel um it's not that the character converts to christianity to find some sort of redemption or something like that it's no it's not a love between a victim and a perpetrator it's not a love story between two survivors in ghettos or camps or you know the books that have come out recently about this um and it's rather american at times in in her how she presents certain stories um and there isn't this sort of form of of resilience in that type of way you know love you know saves the day sort of thing um it does in one sense because without quinn's help um you know the the, the main character wouldn't have arrived in britain but um that sort of sense of um yeah love saves all sort of thing is is not necessarily there as strong as it as i suppose it, it could be or it is in other novels um i mean i'm wondering why she had to put like a romance story in there anyway this sort of thing with you know she doesn't have a, a very good uh encounter with Heine, but with quinn it, it's totally different and again is this because she feels more british and she's leaning more towards that sort of identity and wanting to become more british and clearly feels safe with him she feels um you know that he's helped her sort of thing um it's not a, a typical romance novel in that sense in terms of a holocaust romance novel um so yeah no i'll, I'll leave it there thank you for um talking with me <laughs> and i look mm -hmm. to hearing your thoughts Yes, thank you, Amy. That was really interesting. And there is really a lot to think about, <laughs> to say the least. Um, I realize you were thinking of Ava Ibbotson. Sometimes you said Ava Hessa, who I think oh, you've done I? work on because of Kinder oh. Transport. <laughs> sorry. I knew you meant Ava Ibbotson, the author. That's fine. That's understandable. I kept saying Ava, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fine. 